Let's go ahead and pray together, okay? Father, we come here because we are called to be a disciple, a learner, someone who is able to find our position at the feet of Jesus. And Lord, our desire is as we attend ourselves to his instruction and to what his followers gave to us as well, that we would see the complete and the total truth that you want us to take home. And Lord, we readily admit that we sometimes are selective in our listening or we swing from one extreme to another. And so we pray that you would guard us from that and give us the heart of humility that says, Lord, tell us what we need to hear and protect us from moving from one extreme to another so that we could allow you to speak the whole truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's what I first experienced as a young follower of Jesus Christ. It may be what you heard about in your earliest days of faith. As a mentor to friends, to those who have just placed their faith in Jesus Christ, it's something that we desire to drive home and to nail down in their own hearts and thoughts. And if you're visiting with a family member or maybe a friend who, whose days on earth are literally limited, where they are battling for their lives and maybe even ready to be at home with the Lord and even absent from this body, it's the one truth that we repeatedly underscore for them to take into eternity. We assure them of their salvation. We say something like, based upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, we want you to be absolutely sure that if you were to die today, and I hope this doesn't happen, but we say to them, if you were to die today, that you would be immediately transported into the presence of God. And we repeatedly, emphatically, with great conviction, drive home the singular truth that if they believe in Jesus Christ based upon their profession of faith, there is absolutely nothing that will ever shake them loose from the hand of the Father. Because God is sovereign. His promises are strong. His word is faithful. We tell them that their relationship with God is safe and secure. And the reason we do that, the reason we need to hear these words is because doubt could so easily slip into our hearts. It's as if we're perched on a mountaintop and we look into a city and we think, am I truly saved? Sometimes I don't feel like a child of God. I know I've made a decision in the past. I know that this was a part of my experience. I know that I've grown up in church or I've made a commitment at a campsite. I know that I've prayed a prayer, but there are times in the honesty of my own heart where I wonder, am I truly in relationship with God? Is God truly my Father because Jesus is my Savior? And the reality of human life is that sometimes we mess up. And when we stumble and fall, we begin to have questions about the security of our relationship with God. We might have hesitations and doubts if, in fact, God has really welcomed us once and for all into his family. It's possible that maybe you grew up in church and there was a segment of your life where you slipped away from the gospel and moved away from the church, and then you eventually came back in the goodness of God, but that period of a prodigal life raises questions in your own heart. And we think, do I truly belong to God? And so we think about the value of being assured of our salvation. And much like the apostle whom Jesus loved, John wrote in his first letter, I write these things so that you who believe in Jesus, if you have the Son, you have life. And he writes because he wants us to know. He wants us to have conviction. 
He wants us to possess an unshakable certainty that we truly have eternal life. Have you ever been there? Have you ever wondered if, in fact, a relationship with God is absolutely sure that there is a conviction in your soul that your relationship with God is anchored in a Father who keeps all of His promises, in a Savior who finished the work on the cross for us, and a Spirit who truly lives inside of us. You see, we want people to know that if they believe in Jesus, they have eternal life. And so we emphasize that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ, and that it's not of works so that we wouldn't have a leg to brag, that we would not have a, boast, a basis for boasting. And contrary to what we would intuitively imagine that good works are a ticket to heaven, we repeatedly underscore the truth that Paul hammers out in his third chapter to the Roman believers, that a person is justified or declared righteous, is made innocent before God by faith apart from the works of the law. In other words, we say it's what Jesus has already done. There's absolutely nothing that you and I could do to ever earn a shred of favor before the eyes of a holy and a just and a righteous God. In fact, I could become, and you might become, so passionate and so protective in our defense of this sacred, pivotal teaching on how a person becomes right with God that we actually completely obliterate and erase the role of works in our faith. And without intending to do so, we inadvertently foster a false sense of assurance. See, while we want our friends and family to be sure that their salvation rests upon what Jesus has already done for us and the sovereign hand of the Father that holds us and the indwelling presence of the Spirit that is a guarantee for God's final redemptive act of salvation, we don't want the notion of assurance to suggest that we can live as we please, that we could do whatever we want, that we're the one who calls the shots. You see, people who claim to trust in Jesus but live on their own terms may not be a part of God's family. Folks who attend church on the weekend but follow a different standard and a different paradigm the rest of the week may not truly be saved. Because even though we are saved by God's grace through faith alone, not of works so that no one could boast, Paul says we are also his workmanship. That God has created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, faith and works go together. We cannot separate one from the other. And the way that Martin Luther and John Calvin put it, the reformers of five centuries ago, they said that while God saves us by faith alone, saving faith is never alone. While God saves you and me by faith alone, the faith that saves is never alone. You see, there's absolutely nothing that we could ever do to earn God's favor. We're saved by grace through faith alone on the merits of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But if we have truly received God's gift of life, then something tangible and visible and concrete and even completing will be expressed in how we live out that faith. And so we're going to see today that a faith that does not work is a faith that does not work. If we have a faith that does not produce something uniquely Christ-like in our life, then the reality is that our faith is inoperative. It's ineffective. In fact, the New Testament uses words that are painfully graphic that would horrify the one who is sensitive to the words of God. And so the title for this morning's talk is The Total Package, because the evidence for genuine faith is the expression of godly faithfulness. A faith that does not work is a faith 
that does not work. In preserving and articulating the truth that we are saved by faith alone, it's possible for me to discount or maybe even for you to diminish the role of what we do. But instead of thinking either or, faith or works, the New Testament writers actually pair them together. They link them side by side. Faith and works go hand in hand because how we live completes what we truly believe. And so I'd like you to turn with me to James, the second chapter found toward the back pages of the New Testament. And we want to see how James develops this truth of the complete package, the total package, that faith and works are paired together, and you cannot have one without the other. We're going to start by listening to a major question that James raises. Can a faith without works save us? And we're going to see that in verses 14 to 19. And then in verses 20 to 26, he's going to offer a persuasive argument based on two biblical examples, Old Testament stories, one that is known by every well-meaning, pious Jew, and one that would be lost in the memories of even the most faithful of Jews. And we're going to see this persuasive argument, how the faith that saves us displays works. Whenever we read through the pages of the Bible, it's apparent that the first readers, like us, had some good faith-related questions. And the earliest believers struggled to understand the message and the implications of the gospel, of what it means to be a sincere follower of Christ. And that's especially apparent in verses 14 through 19 in James, the second chapter. And so he raises a big question. Can faith without work save us? The opening line in our passage brings us into the conversation that James enters into with these dispersed, dislocated, declared followers of Christ. This is what he writes in verse 14. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? And then here's the major question. Can such faith save this person? What good is it if someone says that they believe in the gospel but there's nothing in their life that shows it? What's the value if someone says they're religious but there's nothing uniquely godlike in how they live their life? And the clincher of the question is, James writes, hey, if a person says that's their kind of faith and yet their life moves in this direction, let's back up and be real. Can that quality of faith really save them from God's wrath? Can that kind of confidence in that expression of the gospel truly save them from God's wrath? And the way that James frames the question, it's a rhetorical question that awaits an emphatic negation. It's as if James says, can that faith save him? Absolutely not. Is two and two plus, is two plus two equal, does that equal five? And the crowd would say, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. And it's in the same way James says, you know, if you look at a faith that a person declares and if you look at a quality of life that moves in a different direction, that's as ludicrous and as much of a joke as two plus two equals five. Can that kind of faith rescue them from wrath and restore their relationship with God? And James has absolutely total clarity in his response. There's not a chance in heaven or on earth that that kind of faith could save them. Students proclaim an allegiance to Jesus, but there's nothing different or distinct in their actions that sets them apart from their non-Christian classmates. Families move into their homes and they decorate it with a plaque with a verse out of Joshua 24 that says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, but their lives are so crazy busy and jam-packed with things that moves them in a different direction where it's obvious that the Lord is not the master 
of this household. Their workspace signals their religious preference. They listen to instrumental Christian music, and they have a Bible on the corner of their desk. And yet people look at that colleague, and they think that person is condescending and self-righteous and even hypocritical. And to whom much is given, much is required. But they lack generosity in the way that they give of their time and their resources. Folks claim to have faith, but their life is empty. Our mouth says that we love and serve Jesus, but our life fails to back up and support that profession. You see, their beliefs may be sound and they're accurate, but they don't influence and they don't shape the course of their lives. And using the language of James's first chapter, They're attentive, they're good hearers of the word, and they're great note-takers, and they're great podcast listeners, and they're great students of the sacred text, but they don't do it. And James says, can that kind of faith truly save a person if they've got a mind that is full of good information, but a life that lacks the expression of that truth? You see, they imagine a relationship with God where we could separate our faith and actions. And rather than seeing a correlation between the two, they become comfortable with one thing and yet doing another. And so we could use various adjectives to describe Christians. We could say someone like, oh, that person is a nominal Christian, or that person is a lukewarm Christian, or that person is a half-hearted Christian, or that person is a well-meaning Christian, to distinguish them from the people that we call born-again Christians, or the serious Christians, or the conservative Christians. And James is thinking, that's a joke. There's no way to categorically separate followers of Christ as those who are not serious and those who are serious as those who call their own shots and those who surrender to him. Because a man or a woman, a student who professes an allegiance to Christ, will have a life that backs up that profession. It's not simply hearing the word, James writes, but it's doing the word that marks out our allegiance to Christ. It's not simply having a good form of beliefs or a sound set of theology to believe in and to study, but it's having that theology trickle down into how we live out our life. So that it's not simply theology believed, but it's theology practiced in our lives. You see, a faith, according to James, that does not work, that does not produce faithfulness and godliness and Christ-likeness is a faith that is useless. It doesn't work. It's as good as a cell phone without any service. It's as good as as a car that has no engine. It looks good from all appearances, but it has no practical use because it has the appearance of being able to make a phone call or to take us from one place to another, but it's utterly ineffective. And then he, having just warned us about the danger of favoring the wealthy over the poor, James in verses 15 and 16 paints a vivid picture of how a faith without works is utterly useless. Take a look at verse 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. They are in the most desperate of situations. And if one of you says to them, go in peace, shalom, the, the, the blessing of the righteous, Keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. You don't take them in. You don't provide them a garment. You don't offer them a meal. James says, what good is it? It's simply talk, even spiritual language, shalom, but no practical assistance. Because a faith that does no good is no good. A faith without works is utterly useless. And then in verse 17, in addition to being useless, he talks about how a faith without works 
is lifeless. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. It's not simply having potential. It's not merely coming along. It's not merely in its early phase of development. But he uses language that would horrify the most pious of Jews. Because if there is a dead body, that that would be the thing that they would be the farthest away from for fear of defilement. And James borrows that language that the, that the well-meaning, educated Jew would take as anathema, as horrible, as deplorable. And he says, if a man or woman, if a student says that they have a faith in God, but that faith simply says, hey, may God take care of you. They see a guy buck naked or starving, and they don't offer a jacket or clothing or shelter or a meal, then that person simply sounds religious but there's nothing of substance to back up that profession of faith. And James says, a faith like that can not only not save us and is utterly useless, but it's actually lifeless. It is dead. It is deplorable. It is to be abhorred. It is their absolute worst nightmare. You see, James anticipates and then he answers an objection from a professing believer who is taking in his letter. And it's possible that, that as we hear this objection, this is something we could slip our feet into as far as, man, that's exactly what I'm thinking. This is where my thoughts are moving. Take a listen to what he writes in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. In other words, James anticipates the possibility of someone walking in and saying, well, you've got good theology and you believe the right thing, but then there are other people that are really dedicated and are very serious, and they're thinking about even becoming a vocational missionary <clears throat> or pastor or doing something completely radical with their life. But James answers that objection in the mid part of 18. He says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You see, instead of being an either-or proposition, either we have works or we have faith, James drives home the truth, the total package, that it's a both-and scenario, where the pattern of our life confirms the profession of our lips. How we consistently act reveals what we sincerely believe and how our faith in the Messiah shows up in our faithfulness for his kingdom. You see, James wants us to, to wake up. He wants us to get a reality check. He wants us to understand that a cerebral, intellectual, verbal belief in Jesus is not enough. And to drive home his point, James says that those who think it's adequate find themselves in the company of fallen angels. Take a look at verse 19. He says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Excellent. Bravo. Wonderful. Even the demons believe that and shudder. <clears throat> We're not exactly sure what James is saying here. We, he, it's possible that he's being ironic that he's playing with his audience, that he's poking at his readers. He says, you believe in God? That's good. Even the demons believe in God. Bravo. Good theology. But it's possible that James is not being ironic, but he's actually being straightforward. He says, you believe in God? That's good. That's the starting place. But even the demons, they believe in God. They recognize the judgment that awaits them, and they shudder in fear. And the dot, dot, dot is the readers who think that they could have faith without works, that they ought to, like the demons, shudder in fear, because if that is the leg that they stand on, then they have no basis for assurance. Because genuine faith will necessarily lead to godly faithfulness. 
And he says, if that's your belief, that is good enough to believe and you can live as you please, then you ought to be shaking in your boots. You ought to have a realization that just like the fallen angels, judgment awaits you unless you come to believe the total package. That real faith leads to resilient faithfulness. A guy named Pat invented the steak sandwich back in 1930. And so what started as a little stand at the southern end of South Philly's Italian market is now one of the most famous cheesesteak shops in the world. And Pat's is open 24 hours, seven days a week, every day of the year. And there's always a line of people who make the trek for their signature sandwich. And so back in 2012, when our family first visited New York City, we also took a side trip to Philadelphia. And if you go to Philadelphia, you want to have a Philly cheesesteak. If you go to Buffalo, you want to have a Buffalo wing. And so you want to have the signature meal of that town. If you come to Los Angeles, you come to Los Angeles. <clears throat> Maybe you go to Pink's Hot Dogs or have an In-N-Out Burger, something uniquely Los Angeles. Maybe Felipe's French dip sandwich, and you guys are showing signs of hunger. But this is a picture of my Philly cheesesteak sandwich in the south end of South Philly. And I'm not really a cheese guy, so I didn't get any cheese. It's a little bit insulting to the Philadelphians, but I will not be pressured. And so if you go there 24-7, 365, there is always a line before you and always a line after you. And as you line up, heart begins to palpitate, not because of the sandwich, although that will happen. But the heart starts getting excited. We start looking at the board. We start turning in, tuning into people and how they order because if you are a Philadelphian, you know how to order the sandwich. If you are a tourist, you better learn how to order the sandwich or you're going to get some South Philly attitude because you're holding up the line. And so if you are prepared, and I am preparing you because I love you as your pastor, <laughs> you only need to know three words to order your sandwich. See, there's three things you want to consider. First is you want to order a cheesesteak. And you're thinking, okay, I got that one. The second thing is you want to decide the kind of cheese. And the third thing that you must decide is whether or not you want fried onions. And so all you need is three words. For example, you could simply say, one whiz wit. You are telling the person behind the counter that you want one Philly cheesesteak with cheese whiz, which is the preferred cheese, and you want it with fried onions. The last thing you want to do on the south end of South Philadelphia is to stand at the side and say, oh, I'm not sure what I want. And you don't want to say, I want one cheesesteak with cheese whiz with fried onions. It's one whiz wit. Another way you could order is you could simply say one provolone without. One cheesesteak with provolone cheese without fried onions. If our church was in Philadelphia, and if James was giving this letter to us, he would say, how do you want your faith? You want your faith with or without? <laughs> with works or without works? Because there's no H in Philadelphia, in the word, but not in their pronunciation. And that's really what James is raising to us. Can we think we have the kind of faith that saves us without works? He says, absolutely not. That kind of faith cannot save a flea. He says, we must have faith with works. The central issue is that authentic faith 
produces real faithfulness. The faith that saves us from God's wrath and punishment is not empty of works, but it's expressed through works. And so James will offer now a persuasive argument that the faith that saves us displays works. Take a look at verse 20. James is a biblical historian, and he's going to offer two pieces of solid evidence for a living, useful faith, how a good choice signals a genuine commitment. He says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions They were not canceling each other out. They were not either or. They were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see, that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. James takes us to one of the best known stories in the Old Testament and unquestionably the most memorable event in Abraham's life. Toward the end of his life, Moses tells us in Genesis 22 that the Lord tested Abraham. And he called Abraham for his ultimate challenge. Abraham. And Abraham responded, here I am. And Abraham commanded, was commanded by God, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. And in the very next verse in Genesis chapter 22, we are completely blown away because it tells us that Abraham rose up early and did exactly what God commanded him to do. And just as Abraham is about to offer up his son, an angel of the Lord stays the arm of Abraham and calls out to him, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham, just as he did in the beginning of the story, says, God, here I am. And God says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your only son. Your only son. You see, as Abraham looks up, he sees the Lord's provision of a ram. At that moment, to sacrifice to the Lord. And he celebrates the provision of God, even as God celebrates the integrity and the completeness of Abraham's faith. You see, facing his ultimate test, enduring his absolute worst nightmare, Abraham shows the sincerity and the strength of his faith in the Lord through his obedience. In verse 22, James comments that Abraham's faith and actions were working together. It's the word from which we get they're synergizing. They're blending together in the same way that God works all things together for good, that Abraham's faith and works were working together Abraham's faith, James tells us, was made complete. That's the same word in chapter 1, where we're to let trials have its perfect and complete work within us. And so God declares us righteous on the basis of genuine faith in Jesus. But when our faith is real, we will do what God says. In other words, the continuing obedience of our life confirms and reveals our initial faith. The trials that James talks about at the onset of his letter and the test that Abraham faced in his lifetime and the hardships that we encounter in our own faith journey 
become occasions to show that our faith in Jesus is both authentic and growing. Because whenever God calls us, perhaps to the most challenging moment of our lives, when we respond with a, God, here I am, I'll do whatever you want me to do, we prove that we're not simply hearing the word, but that we're ready to do it in our life. You see, the integrity and the maturity of our faith are evident through our submission to the Lord. And then after drawing upon Israel's, one of Israel's greatest hero, heroes at his spiritual best, James takes us to the land of Jericho. And that's where we find an unlikely out-of-the-box character whom the biblical writers applaud as a heroine of faith and faithfulness. Take a look at verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? In the second chapter of Joshua, we meet Rahab, and she has two strikes against her. She's a prostitute, and she's a Canaanite. In other words, there's nothing about her that would earn God's favor. She's just like us, in opposition to God without the cross. But when she heard of the nation's exodus out of Egypt, she turned to faith to believe that the Lord God of Israel was truly the Lord God. And so she provided hospitality to the spies of the nation of Israel and sent them off to safety. And the writer to the Hebrews also includes the prostitute Rahab for her act of welcoming the spies as a display of her faith. You see, what Rahab does for the spies confirms who she believes in for her salvation. And what we do in our lives signals the reality of who we truly believe in. And then James wraps up our passage in verse 26. After talking about the quality of a living faith and the evidence of what it looks like through works, he talks about the emptiness of a dead faith. He says, as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. In other words, a deedless faith is a deadly faith. A visible faithfulness in our lifetime proves a vibrant faith in the Lord. Dr. Vijay Periya Coyle, over the last 15 years, has been a geriatrics and palliative care physician. And she's had candid conversations with countless patients near the end of their lives. And she's discovered that the most common emotion that they express is regret. Regret that they never took the time to mend broken friendships. Regret that they never told their friends and family how much they care for them. Regret that they are going to be remembered by their children as hypercritical mothers or authoritarian distant fathers. And so this physician in the Bay Area came up with a project to encourage people to write what she has described as a last letter to their loved ones. It's called the Stanford Letter Project. It can be done when someone is ill, but it's, she says it's really worth doing when someone is still healthy and in conversation with their family and friends. In other words, before it's too late. And it's called a life review letter. And this is what she says should be included. She gives us a template. You can go to, you could search for this Stanford letter project, and there's actually a template where you could fill things in for seven different categories. And you could do some or all of these categories. And this is what she suggests. Acknowledging people in our life. Remembering key moments. Asking for forgiveness. Forgiving others. Jotting down the names of people that you want to express your thanks to. Including people that you want to tell them that you love them. And then finally, just a simple 
word of goodbye. You see, sitting down to write a letter could be a power-filled, hope-giving, even life-shaping experience. And directed by the Spirit, James sits down. He writes a letter because he wants you and me to live a life with no regrets. No regrets today. No regrets forever. And the ultimate regret in life and eternity is thinking that we're saved, but we're not. Thinking that we're secure, but we're actually still an enemy of God. Being assured of our standing before God, it matters. Because we have friends who have been plagued by false guilt and intermittent insecurity. But we want to make sure to anchor our sense of assurance in the truth, in the whole truth, in the total package. Because a faith that does not work is a faith that does not work. The total package is faith and works. Because the faith that saves us, it is by faith alone in Christ. But saving faith is never alone. And so let's reaffirm that a real faith works together with robust faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, we are quick to latch on to things that make us feel good and safe and secure. But then it's also hard to maybe take in the things that might raise questions and doubts. Father, you save us by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ, because there's nothing we can ever do. But we understand that the faith that truly saves is never by itself, but it gives daily evidence that we are in your hands that your, son is our, in our, that your Son is our Lord and that your Spirit is our leader. And Father, our prayer this morning is that our sense of security and even assurance would be based on what Jesus has done and who he is making us to be. And we pray this in his name.